The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. There have been many photographers who we've spoken to over the years for whom photography was not their first career. For some, photography has been a hobby that's blossomed into something more. For others, a sudden life event led them to follow a career with a camera. Stories like these help to remind us that a photographic life can manifest itself in so many different ways. Michelle Gellerman is a wildlife and nature photographer for whom photography has become a parallel career. It's not become her sole means of earning a living, but she has used her primary career and her understanding of finances to create opportunities for her to travel the world and make some amazing photographs, along with working with organizations that are helping to protect wildlife, including African elephants. There are so many stories of how people make their passion for photography a bigger part of their lives. And I hope that this particular story is one that will both entertain and inspire you. Well, Michelle, welcome to The Candid Frame. It's a real pleasure. Pleasure to have you. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. I I saw your work in the Women in Photography blog. And I read your story there and I thought, oh, this might be a good person to talk to. Because not only like your wor- your work, but I also like the story. Thank you. I, it's fun to combine a passion with um, a profession. So um, I hope that I've been successful in, in advancing the things that are important to me at the same time as um, making a little bit of a living. Yeah. Because I, I think a lot of people who listen to this show are, are, are have or are doing something for a living that is likely not related to photography and then they have an interest or a passion of somehow trying to find a way of making photography a bigger part of their lives. And it, and it's not necessarily that they have to become a professional photographer, but that some, some way, at least they find a way of having the hobby pay for itself. Right, right. And I will admit, I do have another job, and I'm using air quotes there, um, that uses the other side of my brain completely. So I'm a little bit bipolar when it comes to the things that occupy my time. And I think that that's really sort of a, a viable way of approaching this effort rather than feeling like, oh, you have to abandon everything that you've been doing before in order to try to make an attempt here. And I think one of the things I like hearing from people is, is how each person finds their own path to making this work. So first off, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your background? Cause you were working as a, a business, uh, as a business, business consultant and as a CPA. Tell us about that part of your life before we get into the photography. <laughs> well, and unfortunately I still am, or maybe fortunately because it allows me to participate in the photography. Um, I started as an accountant, as an auditor and very quickly escaped that and went into consulting with banks, um, implementing mergers and acquisitions. And that's progressed through my life to uh, working with both nonprofits and for-profit companies in a financial and non-financial role, either in a CFO or as an operational consultant, uh, work helping them deliver their mission. So that continues. Most of my clients are nonprofit clients, so it's it's actually fun to work with people who are working about with something they care about uh, very much and helping them advance their cause. And photography has has it always been an interest? Or did you, you know, start to pick up the camera a little later in your life? Everything in my life seems to have happened a little later. I I took a year off in 1989 and bought a round the world ticket and uh, took a backpack and took a camera. Uh, And one of the first places I went was Kenya. I stayed there for two months and fell in love with it. 
Back then, you had to develop your film on the road. So I came back with rolls and rolls and rolls of developed film and hadn't seen a thing that I had shot other than holding it up to the light. And the the photos weren't very good. So um, I put it down for a while and then picked it up again, probably in early 2000 when I started returning to Kenya for a number of reasons. So it's, it's actually a more recent passion. Well, well, tell me about that moment back in 89 when you decided to take this trip, because I think a lot of people imagine God, they would love to do what, what you did back then, right? And often the the reason they don't do it is, well, it's money and more well, I can't afford to take off the time. You know, I have so many things to do and they have so many different excuses as to why they don't do it. What What was the impetus for you to make the decision to do it? I was burned out and... I, it, at that point, I was under 30, um, but I was working for one of the big eight consulting firms. I guess they're down to four or five now. And I was on the road five days a week. And in, you know, Monday it was Chicago, Tuesday it was Boston and did that week in and week out and, and really just came to a point that it was not fun anymore. And I decided to, kind of take a completely different approach to travel. Be- business travel is, is pretty comfortable. And I just, I took a backpack and a whopping $3,000 and made it last for a year uh, as I traveled around the world, staying in $2 a night hotels in Bangkok and the back of pickup trucks in Kenya. Um, but it really, it, it gave me perspective that I never would have gotten otherwise. And it turned out to be a great benefit when I went into job interviews after I returned because people were envious and people wanted mm. to do that and they respected someone someone taking the time and following that dream and so it actually opened more doors from a business perspective than it closed which everyone predicted it would close more doors when I left. What did you learn about yourself as a result of that trip? A lot. Um, one, I learned I'm, I'm pretty tough <laughs> that um, I can handle a lot of situations that that present themselves that that I would have suspected I would have struggled with some dangerous situations and and some situations that you just would like to avoid. Um, I learned that food and lodging are very important elements of your life, and that's what you need to address first. But probably the biggest thing I learned, and it was it was really difficult for a while, is I stopped defining myself by what I did for a job. And I would meet people and they'd say, tell me about yourself. And I'd say, I'm a consultant. And this very blank look would come over their face. Mm. And I realized there needed to be more to me than just my job and what I did. Traveling as a woman back then, even now, it can be It can be be a challenge, but especially then, I'm sure that a lot of your friends and family were concerned about, you're going to do what? Tell me, tell me about, you know, the challenges that you faced then traveling alone as a woman. (laughs) They did. Um, My parents uh, have given up on me. And (laughs) this was in a time when you really couldn't keep in touch. The way I communicated was people looked at my schedule and uh, tried to figure out where I'd be in a couple of weeks. And they sent letters to the American Express office. And I would um, hopefully get those by the time that I got to whatever city they sent them to. You run into a few troubles traveling as a woman, but you learn very quickly how to adapt and how to ensure your safety without limiting the experience. And how has that changed now? I mean, you, you may kind of mention in terms of communication being a big factor. Uh, well, today, I, I my cell phone is on, my email is available, and I can check in with, with folks along the way. Before, we we really had to, they had to wait and make sure that I was okay in a couple weeks. <laughs> so, tell me about the, the big turning point for you photographically, which is back in 2006, because, you, you know, the trip you just talked about happened in 89, but there was a big gap between then and you finally coming into your own as a, as a photographer. What what resulted in, in that sort of transformative moment for you? I think it was the moment that I realized what I was passionate about. And I've noticed in my photographs, even today, if I'm photographing something that I don't have a personal connection or an emotional response to, the photographs are somewhat lackluster. But if I'm photographing something that I care deeply about or have a a reaction that stirs me to the core, the photographs tend to reflect that. And I had the opportunity to travel with some folks with family in Kenya so I got a very different and and more intimate experience of of the lifestyle of the conservation efforts and the people there. And so I think I, I 
just happened upon my passion. One of the things that really drew my attention in that story was the work that you had done recently on elephants, mm -hmm. African elements, elephants, which I have a particular fondness for. Tell us about those images and, and your understanding of, you know, the, the risk that these, these great, beautiful creatures are, are subject to. Elephants are amazing to watch and extraordinarily interesting, even if you don't have an interest in their continued uh, conservation. The, the family units, their interaction as a group and amongst individuals is just fascinating. You can watch for hours. But I was fortunate to spend time with people that were really devoted to ensuring the safety and longevity of these animals. And there are a lot of smart people working on this, and I don't think we've come up with the answer, but there are probably three big threats uh, for the elephant population. There is the threat of poaching, which is very well publicized, and there are certainly inroads being made to uh, stop or slow down the poaching, but we have a long way to go. But the tougher elements that are impacting um, elephants are the human-wildlife conflict. An elephant goes into a village and destroys a family's garden, uh, the garden that will feed them for the rest of the year. That's, there's a tough decision that needs to be made by everyone in that situation. And that happens on a regular basis. And then another difficult threat to solve is the um, expansion of the human population resulting in the loss of habitat. These animals require hundreds and thousands of miles to roam and, and, and require a great amount of food. And as populations grow, that land becomes scarcer and scarcer. And th tell me about your work with the uh, with with your organization in terms of you know how you develop the relationship with them and how your images have been used to promote the work that they're doing. I I developed the relationship through friends initially, and then as I made friends with them, started sp speaking with other people there. I, they couldn't get rid of me. I just kept showing up on their doorstep, <laughs> saying, "This is important to me. I want to help. Tell me what I could do to help." And in some cases, they leaned upon my financial expertise and asked me to help there. I spent several weeks in Kenya uh, working on the financial systems for a wildlife conservancy. But it gave me the opportunity, obviously, to photograph while I was there. And my photographs have been used in their fundraising efforts, which are extraordinarily difficult. And, and images help to gain awareness and understanding by potential donors, but also in their education uh, efforts, educating people both within Kenya and outside of Kenya as to who, who elephants are, if you will, mm -hmm. and, and why it's important and how having these wonderful creatures on our planet is important to all of us and not just to a few people that want to go out and, and look at them on safari. I think it's really kind of interesting that you're able to take both facets of your life and sort of combine them. <laughs> I, I can never escape the financial side. I try. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I, I, think a lot, I, think it's a, I think people lose sight of the fact that, you know, they have experience and skills that even though they may not end up doing that job specifically in which they develop those skills, that somehow that they may be able to use those experiences as sort of a resource that can help them in some way as they explore other facets of their lives, especially the creative ones. And I think, I, and that's kind of what I like about your story is that you've sort of been able to, to do that for yourself. Well, what's, what's nice is I don't have a science background and I don't have a long history of being on the ground in Kenya. And I see, or in Africa, I should say, I see these organizations who are trying to do so much with so little. And it's nice to be able to provide them some benefit, even though I don't fit the normal mode of, the, of, of their work in the field. Well, when you, you talk about, you know, what you're passionate for, can you just define that for me a little more clearly as what you've come to understand as your passion? What exactly is that? It, it can be very specific, and I could drill all the way down to, I want to make sure that elephants are here for the next generation. But it, it really is broader uh, because the issues that they face are being faced by other creatures on this earth. It's My passion is to help people understand that while we may not interact directly with, with these creatures or this environment, it's important for our overall well-being. And it's, it's not that if a butterfly flaps its wings in China, something happens in, in New York City. It's more that a healthy, thriving planet has multiple components, and we have to pay attention to all of those components as we 
as we move forward in life. How is your awareness of, because you know, a lot of people may go to, you know, to Africa and go on safari and take pictures of rhinos and lions and, and, and elephants and so on. And, you know, they come back and they have some wonderful photographs and that's sort of where it ends. And yet for you, you've decided to take it much further and you've done a good amount of traveling in, in your life, but you could have been satisfied with just being a world traveler, making your photographs and maybe, you know, selling some, some, some prints, but you've, you've wanted to do much more with your photography rather than just have a collection of photographs in a portfolio. What is it about what about you? What is it that drives you to do something more than just, you know, pursue the, the you know, make the pursuit of, of, of a nice and pretty picture, uh, your end game? I'm not sure where that originally came from. I do know that in recent years, I think I mentioned earlier, I've had the opportunity to work with some wonderful philanthropic institutions. And what impressed me along the way is people who were making their lives matter for something they cared about. And and I have been involved in many, many philanthropic situations from health and wellness to technology to building homes for the homeless. And I always felt good about those things, but I didn't care as much as they, they did. And when I watched the people that cared and and how it changed and moved their lives, I, I wanted something that I cared that much about. And I was fortunate to find it. I think it's probably a gr- that's a great answer, and I think that's really sort of the key because I, I I think for me, photography in and of itself is, is certainly a passion. But if I can combine it with something else that I, I love or that I'm passionate about or that I'm concerned with, that helps sustain the photography in a way that just being obsessed with the you know with the camera in and of itself doesn't. And mm-hmm. and I think that you, you that's what you're pointing to. Well, here. I I was originally influenced way back when. When I, the first time I went to Kenya, someone suggested I read Peter Beard's End of the Game. And his book was about, at that point, the starvation and lack of water resources facing elephants. Well, there was a little bit of poaching, but it really was, was much greater than that. And the compassion that I felt at that point moved me and has probably driven a lot of what I've done since then. And I look back on what impact he made on me with, with a book. Mm-hmm. hope that there's some impact that I can make on others through the work that I'm doing. We hope you're enjoying our conversation with Michelle Gillerman. I think she's a great example of the kind of people we love to have on our show. These are people who are working hard to make their dreams and ambitions come true. Though they all have a degree of talent, I'm always impressed by the other qualities they exhibit. Qualities like persistence, generosity, and a certain degree of faith. It's these kinds of voices and stories that we love bringing to you, and we hope that you can help us to continue to do just that. Through Patreon, you can support the show with regular monthly donations of $2, $5, $10, $25 or more, or anything in between. Your donations of any amount are the means by which we can improve the show and bring you more great conversations with the world's best photographers. Contribute today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. What's the more difficult part about going out and making these photographs? Is it time? Is it logistics? Is it the unpredictable nature of the animals? It's probably time. It, the unpredictable nature of the animals can can be solved many times with time. Um, I can't tell you how many days you sit in one spot and wait for something to happen. But just trying to run a business back home and then finding two to three weeks that you can go and slow the pace down so you can sit and wait is difficult. Fortunately, I've been able to find good guides and people there that that understand the animals and can predict in large part what they might do and try to get us to the right place so the waiting is less. But it really is my personal time split between the business that sustains my lifestyle and spending time on the road. Is it easy for you to get out of the sort of day-to-day sort of rush, rush, rush sort of mindset that you have here in the States to the moment where you have to be like 180 degrees from that and be practicing uh, almost like a Zen-like meditation and patience? 
It's really scary. The minute the plane door closes, I move into that. (laughs) (laughs) I make lots of promises about being in touch and reading emails and reviewing documents, and it never happens. As soon as the plane takes off, I am am zen. So do, do you feel sort of the pressure? I mean, you can be out there, like you say, you have like maybe two weeks and that's it. Do you have moments where things are just not panning out? And how do you deal with, with the anxiety of like, uh, is something going to happen? Am I going to come back with anything? <laughs> well, I, I've researched other photographers' anxiety with that. And a lot of wildlife photographers shoot for five to 10 good images a year. And they're happy if they've gotten those five to 10 wonderful images. Of course, there are a large number of them that that have much greater hit rates and um, can turn out fabulous work on a, a greater volume. But when I learned that this was not my problem alone and that a small number of photos is actually successful, it, it allowed me to relax a bit. You just mentioned about the, the guides and the people that, that sort of lead you here. And I think a lot of people you know, who are interested in this kind of photography, fixate on the cameras and the lenses that they need to have. But talk to me about the importance of having someone who not just knows the territory in terms of just the logistics, but has a really keen and in-depth understanding of animal behavior. Oh my goodness, it's the most important thing. They can predict what an animal is going to do many times. And just to take a very minor situation, a giraffe was drinking one day and it's an interesting photograph. The, there's a triangle involved. The giraffe is down between its long legs drinking. It's, it's been over. And the guide said, wait a minute, wait until he lifts his head. And when he lifts his head in the last few seconds, he flips his nose up and the spray of water comes out of his, his mouth. I would never have known to wait for that. Mm. That happens every day. So the guide will say, watch this big bull elephant and watch that female. They're going to, this is what's going to happen in the next few minutes. And so it allows you to position yourself for the photograph that you're hoping to get and not waste your time, if you will, on the guy ambling across the plane like every other animal does. How do you find a good person like that? I mean, because a lot of people I know who listen to the show have either wanted to or are planning to, to you know, do their first excursion. But, you know, there's so many uh, tours that are geared for photographers, but you don't necessarily know about who's going to be leading them. So what's your kind of advice? It's tough. I went on a photography tour recently for a specific event that I was very disappointed in the guides and the leaders. It was it was very much drive to the edge of, of the river and wait for something to happen. Um, it's It's really, I've been fortunate that I know people and have been able to know people in the area and have been able to ask around. But I've also, once I find a guide that I like, I go back to him. And there's a there's a gentleman in Amboseli who's a member of, of the tribe that owns land near the Amboseli National Park, who used to work for the Amboseli Trust for Elephants, who I will not go to Kenya without spending time with Eric in Amboseli because he is absolutely the best and he knows and loves these animals and and understands what we're trying to capture. Hmm. Tell me, because I know there are some like protected lands where, where some of these animals are and others are maybe under other other sort of public lands or private lands. Can you explain, you know, how the differences that people have to be considering when they're deciding to make this kind of trip? Mm-hmm. There are national parks, um, and, and I'm speaking right, well, this is probably universal for other countries, but for the most part, there are national parks that are run by the government that allow access to all comers. Um, anybody that comes as a tourist can go into that national park. You can either go in with your with a guide and many of them you can drive in on your own. The better places are the private conservancies, which tend to have been built around the large national parks to protect. Sometimes they consider them to be animal nurseries. They protect the younger animals that will eventually populate that park. And these private conservancies are owned by any number of people. The the two that I like near Amboseli are both owned by uh, Maasai tribes. 
And the tribes have worked with larger conservation organizations to ensure that there's adequate grazing space because the tribes are nomadic and their primary wealth is in their cattle. So grazing space is important, but also to recognize the the protection of the land for conservation and how they can marry the two and and say and and solve two problems with one stone, ensure that their land remains theirs and that the animals remain on the land while ensuring they have a livelihood. And in those cases, you have to be admitted or accompanied by someone who has rights to enter that land. I would suggest if people are looking for a safari, they ask the question, will be will we be entering any private conservancies? Because their experience will be much richer if they do. Tell me about your interaction with people, because I mean, we're, 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 we are talking about photographing wildlife, but there's a certain interaction with communities and, peop- and people and individuals that you have to have. You know, what have you learned from your experience that sort of helped you, helped you to create those opportunities to make the photographs that you do? It's really neat what what has happened um, because the the protection of animals was in many ways the realm of people that came from other countries into these African countries and said, hey, this is important. You need to pay attention to this. And it's now shifted to the people from within the con- countries are are finding the value in this. One of the things I've noticed very specifically in Kenya, because I'm closest to the activities there, is the level of mutual respect between the the colonists, if you will, and the, the tribes people. I expected a more patronizing environment. And what I found was that the people from outside the country, and of course, when I say outside the country, they've only been there for a couple hundred years. Um, and the 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 tribal people who have been there for thousands of years have developed a very strong mutual respect and understand the value that the other brings to the party. And the, the work that they do together is far greater than either would do alone. And, and it's really interesting to see those two interact and in, enjoy each other's company along the way. And, and how have you leveraged your, your work? Because I know that some of the, uh, these organizations have used the, 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 your photographs in their you know, like in their reports and on their websites but but tell me about how how your images are, are being used and and how you're pursuing opportunities for your work to get out there and to create awareness of the creatures that you're photographing well i'm learning a lot and i grew up in the age of books and magazines and as we all know we are now in the age of of online and digital information so i i have been somewhat successful and i am pursuing additional opportunities to work more in an editorial mode, to provide both images and words to tell the story um, for both online and print magazines and other publications. That, I believe, is is where I can be the most successful with this. I am actually speaking with a larger media company about taking them to do um, some filming in these areas with some new technology they have um, for uh, filming um, out in the field. So I think there will be some fun things on the side with with larger media companies, but the bulk of my focus right now is on editorial work. Tell me about just the logistics of going out here, because I can imagine that someone would see this as a one in a lifetime opportunity and take way too much stuff. <laughs> I still do that too. <laughs> but, you know, but I mean, there are certain things you absolutely need, and there's some things that you think you need that you don't actually need that can end up being a sort of a burden to have to trounce around with. What In, in your many years of doing this, what have you learned is essential and you know, and how different are you now as compared to several years ago in terms of those choices? <laughs> well, I take a lot less clothes. Um, I've learned that you can wear a pair of shorts for several days without anyone <laughs> noticing or caring. And this is this is the bush. There's no need to dress up. So I can get away with a very small kit when it comes to clothes and toiletries. From a camera perspective, you want to take all of your lenses and all of your flashes and, and everything else because you think, oh my goodness, what if the opportunity comes to take this photograph and I don't have a reflector to, to light the person's face? What do I do? Um, you really need a long lens, a wide angle lens, and a camera. 
and you can leave the tripods, you can leave the flashes, you can leave everything else at home and you can do very well with just those pieces. And you just mentioned photographing people. So you're not just photographing wildlife because I can see from your website when you're doing traveling, you're doing a real wide diversity of, of, of image making. Tell us about, you know, the choices that you make there. Because for me personally, uh, I'm, a, I'm a minimalist. I hate carrying so much equipment. I feel like if I can't carry it in a small bag, I'm not taking it. And if I miss a photograph, then it's like, okay, I missed the photograph. But tell us about your approach. I, I, I'm moving more towards the minimalist approach. I'm struggling with this actually right this minute because the guy that I mentioned to you in the Ambicelli ecosystem is graduating from warrior to senior to junior elder. And he's invited me to photograph his, his promotion ceremony. And one of the things I wanted to do was do some portraits of the people in his, his community and then provide the images to them for for their enjoyment. So all of a sudden I now have reflectors and I have this portable printer and it's killing me and I'm trying to figure out what actually <laughs> is going to go along with me. Again, you can you can make do with a lot of what's already there. You don't need a reflector, get a white t-shirt, you don't need a background, use a hut. <laughs> So I, I'm struggling with that because you do, you want it to be perfect. And you know, there's situations that you could make perfect if you were doing it at home. But really, you can accommodate a lot um, with the MacGyver approach. You know, what can I put together with what's there? So with, with your business background, with your understanding of financials, how do you sort of look at your photography? Because it can be a kind of a lost leader when you're first starting out. You know, at some point you may find opportunities to break even or, or maybe even make a profit what you're doing. But, you know, the kind of photography that you're talking about doing is not cheap. And we're not even talking about the gear. We're just talking about, you know, being able to afford the time and the travel and just all that other stuff. So when, when you're starting to think about how much do you put into your photography and what kind of return you can get on it, what what are some of the sort of practical ways that you, you have to take a look at it so that it doesn't become problematic you have to you have to recognize that in my situation it it won't be highly profitable that you really are doing this for the love of the activity but there are some things you can do to cut your costs many times while I would much prefer to be on my own with a guide in a land cruiser or walking through the bush it makes it much more financially viable for me to go if I take a couple other photographers along and we, we share costs. Um, I, I, I can get somewhat of a fee for arranging their trip. So the accommodation that I've made for the most part is I don't get to go alone or as often as I'd like. And then, of course, making sure that we've got the right guides in place so we are as efficient as possible. Um, but no, there's, there's no way I can see this becoming something that makes me rich. It will certainly be done for the love of it. But how do you, you know, sort of strike that balance between something that you really, really want to do and then trying to make it work financially? I mean, is it, is it a, 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 is it a way of thinking about in terms of, okay, I'm going to have to save up for this. Do I need to make sacrifices here in order to make that happen? Because, you know, the, like I said earlier, there's, there's a lot of reasons why you can decide not to do something. Mm hmm. And then you can have a situation where you really want to do it. And it's like, okay, how am I going to make this work? For you, I'm kind of really curious as to how you sort of figure it out to make it happen. Well, I do save up for it. Um, and I, I do find ways to make it as inexpensive as possible. But I'm, I'm hopefully within a 10-year time horizon moving into... A much greater time. Uh, I would say more semi-retirement than than um, full retirement. And over the years, I mean, it's been thirty years that I've been saving for my retirement. And my goal with the photography is not necessarily to make a living off of it, because hopefully my retirement savings will support me mm -hmm. as they should, whether or not I do this. But simply to have it pay for itself. So to find um, opportunities for publications to pay a fee or pay for the trip, or media companies that need an experienced on the ground logistics person to um, take them there. 
there and 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 monetize some part of the activity. Um, I do show in galleries. I do sell online. Um, it's putting together as many little pieces as you can that hopefully add up to something that doesn't break you. Do you ever hear from from young people, especially young women, who who find out what you're doing and become just inspired at the thought of being, you know, a wildlife photographer, especially. You know, a woman, because uh, it's still dominated largely by by men. I know that there are a lot of women wildlife photographers, but I'm wondering whether you've had the experience of, of hearing from young people who get really excited at getting to meeting someone who's doing something that they aspire to do. You know, I'm not finding many women who've put this out there as a as a goal. There are a lot of people that look at it as a, as a one time. I want to go. I hear that they're inspired by the fact that I get to go to Africa and see the animals and and spend time there but but not many people are taking it and running with it and i don't i do hear more from from young men actually mm. than young women that that ask questions how do you make it work how can you can you tell me how to get to where i'm going on this um, i don't know what i don't know what's driving that i don't know if women will ever be a driving force in wildlife photography. There are some wonderful women photographers, but I don't see that next class coming up yet. And I'd I'd love to find them and help them. When you're out in when you're out in the field and you're photographing, I'm sure that that when you're in that in your element, that is the moment that keeps you sort of driven to do this over and over again. But can you tell me what it feels like when you're out there and you're there with your camera and you see that animal? What is it that you're feeling in those in those moments that just gets you excited about the next opportunity that you're going to have to do just that? That's a tough question. And there are probably a lot of different answers to it. I think it's the one place that I feel at home. It's the one place I feel I belong. And we certainly, you know, it's, I'm not saying that I'm this <laughs> little hermit that, that doesn't have any friends here at home, but here in the States and at work, you're constantly pushing and struggling and, and it's not, it's not enjoyable and it's not someplace you want to be forever. Hmm. There, I never want to leave. I want to stay there. And I've considered moving over there. It, it feels more like home to me than home does. And how serious are you about the idea of moving there? I've talked to some folks there about how I might accomplish that. I I think it could happen. My life at home will be terribly difficult to unbundle, and that's what I'm thinking through right now. Um, but I, it's a strong possibility that I would find a, an opportunity to live in Africa as as time became more available. You, you mentioned that you're able to sell like some of your work through, uh, I guess, through galleries. Mm -hmm. Tell us about uh, negotiating that world, because that's like <laughs> that in and itself could be considered like a foreign country uh, uh, dealing with all of it's that. It's hard. It's certainly not an easy world. I have, I, I, and I continue to navigate the local uh, Maryland, D.C., Virginia art organizations and primarily work through those. So there are calls for entry. I, I tend to enter jury competitions and show there. And then sometimes that leads to a solo exhibition. But it's, you submit an awful lot for minimal return mm. in that situation. Um, I've yet to find a gallery that will, that it's it's mutually beneficial to represent me on an ongoing basis, um, and even with the wildlife photography, the most of the big publications require that you have an agent, and I'm still trying to navigate that world. Yeah. So it's it's catch as catch can, quite frankly. Can you share with us a, a moment where you were out there making your photographs, where you had that moment of just like, wow, I'm doing what I'm doing, I'm here. That, you know, you were just completely in your moment and you were sort of gobsmacked with the fact that you were experiencing something that you never would have experienced if you hadn't made the choice to, to make the leap. Can you share like a particular moment where you felt that and, and give us some, and paint a picture for us? The, the moment that is, is with me most recently was, had nothing to do with animals. The group of people I was with had gone for a hike and it was hot and I was sunburned and I decided to stay back at the Land Cruiser and just wait for them. And so I was in the middle of the African bush, as far as the eye can see, enjoying the smells and the sounds 
of of being there. The wind rustling through the trees, the sounds of the birds in the trees, um, the smell that's just uniquely the African bush, which is very clean and and enjoyable. And as I was sitting there all by myself, I heard little bells ringing. And a few seconds later, this young boy, probably 10 years old, in full traditional garb, walked past me. The, the bells were, that I heard ringing were the beads and the metal things that hang from the beads tinkling against each other. And as he walked past, he just turned his head and looked at me, didn't really acknowledge me, and continued to walk on. And I realized that I was finally a part of, of this landscape, that I wasn't special and I didn't stand out, that I really had come home and was a part of, of the bush at that mm. point. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that photographer be and why? Oh, there are so many wonderful photographers. I have a friend who influenced me to a great degree. Her name is Robin Robinson, and she does underwater black and white photography, all natural light. She focuses on the large, the whale sharks and the large aggregations of fish. And her work is so incredibly peaceful and calming and just beautiful that I would encourage people to look for Robin Robinson. She's in Carmel, California, and and just does beautiful work. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for your time this morning. I so, so appreciate it. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. I've enjoyed it as well. Thanks to you for listening and to Michelle for joining us here at the Candid Frame. You can find out more about Michelle and her work by visiting Gillerman.com. And we have an editorial correction from last week's interview with Maggie Stieber. In my introduction, I mistakenly attributed the Miami Herald's Pulitzer Prize to its coverage of the Haitian earthquake, which was in error. The newspaper actually earned the award for breaking news story for its stories revolving around the Cuban boy, Elian Gonzalez, who became embroiled in an international custody and immigration struggle between the U.S. and Cuba in the early 90s. We apologize for the error. Thanks to everyone who have and continue to support the show. If you haven't already, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. It helps increase our ranking and creates greater awareness. Thanks to Steve Morin from Japan for his five-star review. You can also support the show by making a regular monthly contribution through Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash the candid frame, or you'll find a link in the show notes and the candid frame website. Thanks to all who have recently contributed to the show, including Donald Hammerman and Nikai and Chandra. You guys are awesome. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS, Android, and Windows. Links for each can be found in the show notes and the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and her music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.